Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 8th, 2018, and before introducing today's guest, I want to correct an error I made in a recent episode. At the end of the episode with Alan Lightman, I read a quote from Tom Stoppard's play Arcadia, and in the middle of that quote, Stoppard's character quotes from the poem, She Walks in Beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Four beautiful lines. I pointed out incorrectly that that poet of those lines was Shelley. In fact, it's Lord Byron. They overlapped almost exactly in their lifespan. It's an inexcusable error, though. I apologize to Lord Byron. And it's a particularly bad mistake because Byron, while not an onstage character in Arcadia, he does get discussed a lot. So he feels like a character. I want to thank listener Larry Guthrie for pointing out my misattribution. We've corrected it in the highlights. And now on to today's guest. Uh, She is Maeve Cohen, the director of Rethinking Economics, an organization working to reform how economics is taught and understood. And that reform is our topic for today. Maeve, welcome to EconTalk. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. So how did Rethinking Economics get started? Um, So I went to university in 2012. um, So quite soon after the the, uh, global financial crisis. And um, I was also studying politics and philosophy, and it was quite astounding to me the difference between the way that I was being taught these different subjects. So politics and philosophy was looking at different ways that you could view these things, um, drawing on different value bases that you could have, and really exploring the discipline like that. Whereas economics was taught as this this one way of of thinking about economics as if it's fact um, with no sort of critical analysis of anything that was happening and and notably no mention of, of the financial crash that had just happened and was, was affecting all of our lives. And so um, me and some fellow students set up a, a group called Post Crash Economics um, at the University of Manchester to try and um, reform the, the curriculum at Manchester. And at the same time, there were there were groups doing this. We found out um, after the fact, um, all all across Europe, and and now it's it's all across the world, and um, who were similarly very discontent with the economics that they were learning and um, wanted to campaign for curriculum reform. So now we are 53 groups in 25 different countries um, of students at universities campaigning for curriculum reform. And you were at Manchester in Manchester in England. Uh, yeah. I don't think your experience would be that much different from a student in the United States. Uh, I don't think that the financial crisis had much of an impact on how we could <laughs> start in the United <laughs> States either, which I like you find I find it somewhat surprising and I'm not I'm not I'm not as shocked by it. I think I'm probably somewhat uh equally disturbed by that fact as you are, but maybe for different reasons that we'll we'll explore later on. But I think I think what what has happened, if I had to guess, I'm not an expert on this, but if I had to guess, I think most textbooks have responded to it by, say, adding a chapter. Um, and they certainly haven't rethought uh, anything fundamental about the way the curriculum is approached. And um, so I, I don't think it's much different in the United States than, than it is there. I think it's the same problem. Of course, part yeah. of the problem is the fact that when you become a professor of economics, as I was for for thirty years, you aren't trained in how to teach. You're, you're trained in the ideas of economics. So the way most of us teach is we go back to our graduate notes from our notes in the graduate classes we took because we didn't save our, our undergrad ones or didn't take very good notes so <laughs> <laughs> most of the time. And then we try to dumb those down and match some curric- some textbook that, that we've adopted. I usually didn't have a textbook, didn't use a textbook, but I certainly was heavily influenced by my, uh, my professors and what I thought was appropriate to teach. And I think that's probably true pr- pretty much everywhere. 
Yeah, um, we did. We, we yeah. So, as I say, in contrast to the to the other disciplines that I was learning in in politics, um, in, in particular, we were given reading lists. Well, and philosophy reading lists of lots of different thinkers exploring different ideas from different viewpoints. Whereas in economics, there's no reading list. You just get the Mankiw textbook, and that is that's what makes up your course. And it doesn't encourage any sort of critical thought of it. It's just presented to you as this value-free science, as if this is what economics is, this is what economics always has been, um, which, yeah, we feel doesn't produce the critical thinkers that we need. And when we are facing such stark economic crises, uh, like the global financial crash or like uh, the ecological crises that we face at the minute or massive wealth and income inequality, um, yeah, the, 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 this lack of ability to think critically about, about economics is, is, we feel, perpetuating these problems. I think most economists like to think of themselves as like physicists, but applying their tools to human beings instead of, say, atoms. And so in physics, uh, there'd be no reason to read Newton. Uh, mm -hmm. And so similarly, because it's all subsumed, everything that was right in Newton, we still teach, and everything that was wrong, we've dropped, obviously, or things that weren't wrong but not fully capturing what we now know is, is a richer story. And we try to do that in economics as well. We say, well, we don't have to read Adam Smith anymore because what was good in Adam Smith we've kept and what was bad or wrong we've rejected as if economics advances like physics does through empirical testing and rejection mm -hmm. of things that don't match the data. But as, as I think you're arguing, uh, that's really not what economics is, is doing. Yeah, so economics is a social science and it's impossible to to – get rid of the complexity of it, it's impossible to strip it down to like a, a linear equation or, or to say that this is what, so this, this, this model works in the UK, therefore it will work absolutely everywhere. It's, it's just not possible to do that. And obviously economics has um, developed from there and there's loads of really interesting and nuanced work going on in the world of economics. But the problem is we do not teach that to our undergraduates and undergraduates are incredibly influential. Like most people who study undergraduate economics will not go on to do a master's or a PhD. They will go on to work in a bank or lead a big business or um, work in the media and or, or work or around vote. the policy table. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, 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 they have this really basic knowledge of economics. It's not representative of the world and isn't, isn't, particularly helpful in a lot of really important scenarios and it creates this sort of economic common sense within society which is actually not helping us address some of the most pressing problems of our time. It raises an interesting question. It's a side note, but uh, you make me think about the fact that psychology, which is a very popular undergraduate major in the United States and I think elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how the way academic undergraduate psychology is taught in universities affects our daily lives through people believing certain things about how the world works that might be true but might not yeah. be, uh, how we see ourselves. Um, it's a really interesting, I think, not fully explored question of how undergraduate curriculum uh, issues get, get transferred into daily life. Yeah, definitely. And I think particularly with the discipline of economics, because economics is such an influential force within society. And for example, um, if you are arguing for a policy, I mean, you've, you've just had your midterm elections, you, you're, you're arguing for a policy. Um, most of these policies have to be backed up with economic reasoning. So we have to be like, yeah, but is it good for the economy? And so what what the sort of economic common sense is within society is 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 really important because it allows um basically it allows politicians to wield it and this is sort of maybe it's a different point about how economics is inaccessible and how a lot of the population are unable to engage with economics so they have to sort of take this 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 version of economics as as given because they're not um encouraged to think about these things or or it's not spoken about in a language that people can relate to or understand or, or um, relate to their, their lived experiences. But it creates this, this huge, hugely powerful discipline that's incredibly opaque um, and that in turn can create massive democratic deficits, which is 
another huge problem. So I think, yes, it is, it is a problem. I'm sure in so many disciplines, it's definitely psychology. And that's really interesting. And I hadn't thought of that. But because economics is such a powerful force in the world, I think it's particularly dangerous within economic um, curricula. And I, I agree. I think uh, even though we probably are, are going to see that we don't – we disagree on a lot of things, but so many we do agree on, which is I think extremely, extremely interesting. I want to mm-hmm. summarize what I think uh, are the two of the key points that, that you've made so far that I think capture what I see as the approach that you're pushing. And, and again, I'm not um, – I'm totally in agreement with these. One is to make people aware that there are other schools of economic thought that – uh, in history, so the history of economic thought seems should should matter, mm-hmm. uh, as well as the diversity of thought at the, in the current day. Uh, and then, uh, secondly, the uh, implication that it's value free. Now, I, I think some of it is value free in the following sense. I think there are fundamental principles of human behavior that that are um, agreed on by people on the left and the right even uh, though they might disagree about what the implications of those those fundamentals are or how they get discussed in policy. So, for example, I think no matter what kind of flavor of economist you are, you might accept the fact that uh, people respond to incentives. You might disagree about what the incentives are. You might disagree yeah. about the importance of monetary versus non-monetary mm-hmm. incentives. Uh, I think Economists of different political stripes can agree that much of what we see in the world around us is emergent rather than designed from the top down, although there's – I think a lot of – there is some nuance there that that people do disagree on. But the aggregation of behavior into what economists call markets is a shorthand for um, how we interact is useful. Now, we might disagree about – how well they work. <laughs> we might disagree about whether they should be left alone and what that actually means. But to me, those are the two cornerstones of economics of any flavor, which is people respond to incentives, which also implies that that there's cost to active to action. Uh, there's mm-hmm. foregone opportunities. That those those two things I think are undeniable. They have nothing to do with whether you're a Marxist or a Neo Keynesian or an Austrian. Mm-hmm. And then that that when we act together, things happen that aren't just the sum of our individual actions, that there's a complexity that makes policy design challenging and that we see all around us that's that's hard to fully grasp uh, with without thinking about it in some depth. So I, do we agree on those things? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think on the sort of complexity issue, um, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that that is another issue that's not – is it translates as well as it could be in undergraduate curricula just you're given a lot of like simple well not simple they're quite they're, they're quite complicated but you're given a lot of um problem sets and models that don't really take the complexity of of the issue um as as well but yeah they don't explain that as well as they could i think but yes i do agree with you yeah you know, on that on that point yeah i i once gave a talk to a group of a PhD economist, you know, a high level, well trained group of people. And I was talking about emergent order, and they were bored out of their minds. They said, Oh, yeah, look, we know all this, markets work. And that wasn't my point at all, it turned out. But the way we have been trained as economists to think about complexity is, oh, it's supply and demand. And we know how that works, as if that stark blackboard model, which I love, by the way, I have a lot of <laughs> affection for supply and demand. I think it's a powerful, simplifying tool, but it is only a tool. It is only a simplification. It doesn't capture the richness of how our interactions actually work in the real world. It's an, it's a crude attempt um, to get at something that's important. But, to, but I think most economists think, well, that is how, that's actually the real world. And that's mm-hmm. a terrible error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, well, I definitely agree. Like supply and demand and and, and and the market and all of these things are incredibly useful. And using these tools have have, have helped um economies and and yeah, it's it's helped people achieve great things and done a lot of good in the world. But the yeah, the point that 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 I that I try and make and the point that we're about is that that it's not the only tool that you can use. And actually in some circumstances and for some problems, it's really not useful at all. And if we are wanting economists 
or people who are economically literate to be to be creating a better world for us all. They need to know more than just that sort of yeah that 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 simplistic model. So two of the things that are that are behind rethinking economics, your organization, are you call democratizing economics and economic pluralism. What do you mean by those terms and why are they important? So by pluralism, we mean, um, yeah, exposing st- students to to the different schools of thought that are out there. And that's, that's yeah, looking at post-Keynesianism, looking at feminist economics, looking at ecological economics, and, and, and looking at the values that underpin each, um, and as well as looking at the, the, the values that underpin mainstream economics, and then... And then, yeah, being able to engage with these schools of thought, where they've come from, um, and wh- where they've got to, why why they think the way that they think, and what that means for for policy implications, um, and then for democratizing economics. So this is something um, that, yeah, I touched on earlier about how how we have a whole population of people that aren't um, included in these economic discussions. So they 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 don't. Economics is so jargon laden and and elitist that a lot of people aren't able to engage with it. Um, and then we get all these policy recommendations or policy proposals that are backed up by economic reasoning, and people don't understand the reasoning, so they're voting voting for policies that they that they don't understand, um, and that creates this massive um, democratic deficit. On the de- democratizing economics point, we have actually set up a, a sister charity called because we realised it's it's. It's basically impossible to reform um, university curricula and <laughs> democratize economics at the same time. So we've, we have a sister charity now called Economy who make – they're just based in the UK, but they do a lot of work on making economics accessible and they run um, crash courses for adults. They do a lot of work in schools and they have a, a website that sort of de-jargons the news. So we've stepped away from that a bit now because it was just too big a task to do them both. <laughs> well, let's talk about the curriculum because I think – Again, ironically, you know, when you listed those you – know, some of the thing, approaches that people aren't exposed to, um, you know, my first thought is, but those are wrong. And, of course, <laughs> you look at some things I'd like to see more of and say, those are wrong. And I think one of the but lessons that, – that, that, in a way, that's not really the point. Like, it's not. You don't have to be a feminist <laughs> economist to benefit from the fact that actually – by understanding why that theory works and how it gets to the conclusions that it gets to, that in itself is an exercise that is useful. It's an exercise that helps you think critically and think more creatively. It's not just learning something by rote. It's it's engaging with with the core of what that that theory is. And that's so you so we yeah. So for example, we champion like teaching teaching students feminist economics, for example, but then we also champion teaching students Austrian economics, which is like the on the political spectrum, the, the opposite, opposite yeah. side. Because there's a lot can be gained from these insights and a lot can be gained from just doing the exercise of actually trying to understand why when you hold these assumptions to be true, do we get these outcomes compared to holding these assumptions to be true and getting these outcomes. That exercise in and of itself will create better, more thoughtful economists, we feel. Well, I agree with that. And I, when, I was, when I was saying that's the wrong kind, I was just – I was being a little bit yeah, facetious yeah. <laughs> but, or uh, satirical. But, but I think um, – you know, one of the lessons here is humility that that you, you one me mm-hmm. uh, person does not have a uh, uh, the ac- access to the truth. Uh, and I just say as an aside, um, uh, when listeners write me and say you have to interview so and so because he or she has this model of how the world works that's correct, and I always want to say, uh, well, I always think. There's no one model that's exactly right, and people who are going around – you learn something sometimes from those people, but they're also a little bit dangerous because mm-hmm. they're they're evangelists, and evangelism has has value as long as you're aware that you're evangelists. I think a lot of evangelists don't realize that, so uh, in economics anyway. I don't know. I'll yeah. leave aside the religious piece of that, but um, uh, – so I, I think it's extremely helpful to be aware that you don't have a monopoly on the truth, whatever your value system is and, and in principle, your organization has the opportunity to do that. Uh, but you do have also a direct. You are trying to build a, a curriculum. I understand that would be either richer or different than than the current standard one that, that you mentioned. Mankiw is textbook, um, and it is a very good textbook for describing a particular f- kind of economics. 
Greg uh, would disagree with that, I think. He, he would say, no, it's just the truth, but um, I'm sympathetic to your approach. What are you? What is your organization doing in the area of curriculum uh, design or implementation? So we do. Um, so as I say, we're born of. Well, we are a student movement, um, and we work in in different ways. So we try and produce research that that shows that um, that 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 there is a problem. So we we produced a book called The Econocracy that was looking at um, seven different universities in the UK and look, examining their curricula. And then we have student groups in different countries that have done the same at their universities. So there's there's the group in the Netherlands have done it, the Norwegians have done it. There's individual universities that have done it as well. The Danes are doing it at the minute, which is exciting. Um, so we try and do that and then we try and create alternatives. So we produced a, a reader, um, so an introduction to pluralist economics that was edited by our students. So that um, looked at 11 different schools of thought um, and that the, the point of that was so that because of this this problem of, of, of a lack of reading lists, that could be something that could complement economic courses and quite an easy win for professors. It's just like, this is in the, the university library explore these different ways of thinking about universities, about economics, sorry. And then the students can also learn that as a tool for for um, learning about uh, new schools of thought. But with regards to creating a curricula, this is, this is, we are not really prescriptive. We don't want to say like, like, like you say, we don't want to be the people saying that this is the way that you've got to do it. Every single university is different. We're in 25 different countries, as I say, and different um, different models and different ways of thinking of um, the economy are more suitable for different countries. So we we haven't um, created a, a curriculum, firstly, because we just don't have the capacity, the amount of time and effort and knowledge and all of those things it takes. We are a campaigning organization, so we don't have those those resources. And we're very, we only have five members of staff, even though we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. But all of our student groups are autonomous groups, and some of them are working on developing curriculas at their own universities. Um, and it's more of creating sort of broad brush strokes of these are the things that that you need to in, include. Or these are, This is like the starting point if you're going to teach um, undergraduates economics. Um, yeah, for example, history of economic thought is is an essential part of that economic history is an essential part of that. Um, so we haven't, we haven't, and we aren't going to um, create a, 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 a template curriculum for people because we don't really think that that's the way to go. It's more of encouraging our students to um, campaign at their own universities and do the, do the projects that they feel will be most beneficial to them. So some of them will be creating curricula and some of our students are currently teaching curricula at universities that they that they've created um, off the back of their, um, their their love of pluralism. Um, but yeah, it's not a sort of overarching thing that we're creating. So you mentioned two things, one very quickly in passing. I just want to emphasize the distinction and the, and their their individual importance, which is history of economic thought and economic history. Uh, yeah. It's remarkable how uninformed we all are about economic history, certainly – you know, I got my PhD in uh, 1981, uh, and I think I was one of the last – I don't think it's true anymore, but I, this was at the University of Chicago, and we were required to take, I think, two economic history classes. I doubt that's true anymore. It's certainly not true at most universities and maybe almost at none, mm -hmm. and that's a shame, although it's certainly more important, I think, for undergraduates and for, as you say, you know, sort of everyday people who have a – who've absorbed some kind of economic worldview, either from their coursework or their uh, – just the air around them, the zeitgeist, to have some understanding of economic history. And one of the things that I find depressing about the United States, I don't think it's well, – you'll tell me if it's true in the UK and elsewhere, but you know, we have this um, – we have this thing called the advanced placement exam where high school students can get credit for college-level classes – by taking an exam and that then they don't have to – in theory, don't have to take the class if they get a high enough score uh, when they get, get to, to college. And those – I don't think I would do very well in those exams, which is either – I know it says something about me or the exam or both. But 
you know, my, my kids took them and I, they would come ask me questions, you know, and practicing for those. And I would, some of my kids took them and I would just say, I have no idea. I don't even know. And I, and, or I'd get the, give the answer and they say, well, well, that's wrong. It turns out it's three. It's, it's C, not B. And I'd say, beats me. So one of the, that's one, pro, that's a problem. That's a little strange, but the, the point I want to make that's beside that fact that I think it treats economics as like it's just a set of facts and results like physics is it's it's extremely free of any context or economic history or complexity about the point you made earlier that something that might work in this country might not work elsewhere. It treats everything as like, you know, the law of gravity, that it will work in Pisa, Italy, as well as Manhattan. And, and that's just not true. <laughs> and it's a yeah. terrible encouragement to, I think, wrong thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, com- I completely agree with all of that. The The instance of multiple choice exams um, yeah. is is like truly shocking. So I was a mature student. Um, I left school at 16 and I didn't go to university until I was 25. And I um, had this idea of what university would be like. And university was going to be this place where everybody's talking openly with each other, like examining mm. their disciplines and like bouncing ideas mm. off each other. Da, and I got da, there and da, Econ 101 da, multiple choice exam was just da. like, this is nuts. This is not what I thought university would be. Um, yeah, it's quite depressing, really. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a that's a side problem, I would say, which is the focus on uh, results rather than ways of thinking. And, and yeah, and, and it's really difficult. Like does. it's 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 really difficult because so particularly in the UK. Um, well, now now that we've got a. Uh, Tuition fees have, have risen dramatically in the last few years, um, and that's the main source of revenue for universities. So they 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 have huge amounts of students coming to study these these courses. So in my Econ 101, there was like 600 students, and it is a real real problem. Like, how do you um, critically engage with 600 students? Like, how do you examine that amount? Of students, and so multiple, this is where the the multiple choice exams have come from. Yep. And I can completely understand the, the the constraints on academics, and it must be, it's a really hard um, square to circle. But I mean, it, it's essential if we want a functioning society. I think. Yeah, I taught I taught um, principles of economics at UCLA to three hundred and fifty people, and I. I made a few decisions at the beginning of the class. One was I would not use a microphone, which was challenging. But it kept my energy level up. When you're going to talk in a room with 350 people, you, you better have a high energy level. Wow, if you know, I use a microphone. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. great. Because otherwise, <laughs> you're just sort of mumbling in the front of the room and yeah. 310 of the 350 are sleeping. But the other thing I tried to do, which I don't know if it worked or not, but I think this is extremely important, is that I tried to have conversation about the questions we were looking at with those 350 students. Of course, you can't let every person participate. There were probably – 30, and most of them don't want to, uh, but there are probably 30 to 50 of those students who would interact with me in, in any one, 30 or so in any one class or 20. And then it wouldn't always be the same every class. But it's not so much that that only 20 people got to talk. 350 people got to hear a conversation just like we're having right now. And I think it's the exchange of ideas and the, the way of thinking like an economist, which is so much more important than What's the ratio of the – what's the marginal rate definition of the marginal rate of substitution? Yeah. A, da 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 And so giving over – you know, when I, when I was a teacher, the thing that used to bother me the most was – the parallel I would make was to astronomy. So in astronomy, you have this unbelievable, magical, awesome, wondrous uh, poetry of the nighttime sky. That's not what you learn in astronomy. <laughs> what you learn – in undergraduate astronomy when I took it, is a dumbed-down version of graduate astronomy, which is a bunch of results you're expected to spit back on an exam, whereas the life-changing classes in any field are the ones that get you to see the world through a different lens. And mm-hmm. and that's what economics, I think, should be and often isn't, which is tragic. Yeah, exactly. And it, it really – depresses me. Um, I don't, I'm sure you've experienced this in your day. You're at a party or whatever, and somebody asks you what you do, and you're like, yeah. oh, I, 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 I work in economics, and they just go blank, and they're just not interested. And there's this this, um, this sense in society that economics is, 
is boring. People understand that it's really important, but they also think it's boring. And it's like, oh my God, it's just not boring at all. And then you talk to them a bit more in depth about it and people are always engaged. Well, usually pretty engaged and excited. And it is, society has done this incredibly good job of making this incredibly dynamic and exciting discipline seem super boring. And that's, yeah, quite depressing for people like us, I'm sure. Yeah, my favorite is... um Woman, a woman was next to me on the plane, and I said to her, she asked me what I did. I said I was an economist. She said, oh, that's too bad my husband isn't here. He loves the stock market. And I wanted to say, <laughs> oh, no. well, that wouldn't have helped. I don't, I don't know much about the stock market. and uh, <laughs> that. But that's what people think. The other yeah. one I like is that must be handy around tax time. Well, <laughs> I hate filling out my taxes, and I'm not good at it. And that's what accountants and tax preparers do, not economists, but – yeah, yeah, I'm terrible at money. I'm yeah, terrible exactly. At money. And people, terrible. people always say to me, oh, that's really funny because you're an economist. economist. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> it's not, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tried for a while to give a different answer. And I think I, I, I forgot. This was, there was a period in my life where I would just, instead of saying I was an economist, I would, I would say something like, I forget what it was, but it might have been something like, oh, what do you do? Well, I'm interested in how... Uh, things work from the bottom up rather than the top down and how things emerge that are the product of, of our actions together but not any one person. Oh, well, that's interesting. What does that mean? <laughs> Whereas if you say you're an economist, it's over usually. Yeah. Uh, it's usually the end of, uh, of the conversation. Um, I, one of the things that gives me hope, and I don't know how you feel about it and your organization, but certainly with the existence of the web today, people have access to so much more stuff than what they're spoon-fed or force-fed by their professors. So isn't that some cause for celebration? Oh, for sure. I mean, we wouldn't exist as a campaign. In fact, there's been iterations of campaigns doing doing similar stuff since the 70s. And I think one of the reasons why we've had such staying power is yeah, because of the internet um, and because there is so much, when people get in touch with us, we can point them in the direction of loads of different resources. And we were talking before about exploring economics, which is, there's a there's a network of, of German groups doing the same thing. And this is one of their projects. And um, they have this website called Exploring Economics, which has loads of online courses, looking at different schools of thought, loads of different resources um, that, that we can point our students in the direction of. And yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible and, and and we can communicate online we can have little reading group discussions and things that are, that are happening online um yeah it's yeah very grateful for the internet and people can listen to econ talk which uh, exactly every, everyone hearing hearing our voices right now is certainly <laughs> taking advantage of the internet almost certainly <laughs> um before we leave the, the some of these issues i, I want to just go back to something you mentioned at the very beginning you talked about how you, the genesis of your interest in these topics was in the aftermath of the financial crisis and that you were involved in something, the post-crash something, what was it? Economic society. Yeah. So w- what do you feel and what did you sense from people who were who were passionate about that at the time? What do you think was the mistake that was made post-crash? What was the opportunity that was missed and in, in certainly in the teaching of economics? Well, I think that the the after the crash, um, lots of people went to study economics because it was so abundantly apparent that economics was super important and was having a massive impact on on um, people's lives. So there's this sort of perception of economics students that they are yeah into the stock market and they just want to go and work in the city. Um, but actually, and, and I, I don't think that that's true in general, but particularly at this time, there was lots of people and there are still lots of people going on to study economics because they want to do some social good. And because of the way that it was taught to us, it's just this sort of abstract theory um, that was completely detached from people and society. It, it, it lost a lot of those people along the way. Those people either became, um, they they sort of, forgot of the the reason that they got involved in the first place or they dropped out or, or changed their major or, or whatever it is that they did. But I think that the big mistake that was made after the crash with um, economics education and the, the big mistake that's, that's still being made is that there are lots of people that have, lots of students that are really thirsty for knowledge and want to do 
social good. And by right. detaching economics from people, which is how it is presented in, in most undergraduates, it's it's doing those people a dis- disservice and therefore doing society a disservice. Yeah, there was an enormous interest, certainly here in the United States, I think, after the crisis, because yeah. we had had this prolonged period of of economic, I would call it stability, slow or pretty good growth for a while. The recessions that we'd had were relatively small. Of course, they people were affected by them, didn't think they were small, but for the economy as a whole and most individuals – did pretty well, and this there was nothing like this in our lifetime. And so a mm-hmm. lot of people, I think, did get a wake-up call. You know, one of them was John Popola, the filmmaker who contacted me, and we made our um, the Kane's Hike rap videos. Really, those happened because <laughs> – Did you make that? I did with oh John. Oh, my God, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. But John, that wouldn't have happened without this filmmaker. The guy was working in television at the time, started reading and thinking, i got to figure out what's going on. I mean, this is weird, this stuff. And – so I think a lot of people got galvanized, and if if it hadn't been for the internet, you know, they would have pulled out some not so exciting book called Economics mm-hmm. that they found in their library. Would have put it down very quickly because it's not very accessible, as you've been saying. But, so, but you know, that for but me, yeah, this, sorry, go on. No, just to say for me, an econ talk. You know, one of the one of the reasons. One of the silver linings of the, of the crisis was it did get a lot of people interested in, in what economics is. They they struggled to gain access to it, as you pointed out. But um, it did cause a, it was a wake up call for a lot of folks who weren't academics, who weren't university students. Just say, and I want to know what's what happened. I want to understand it. In contrast to say the Great Depression, which was a similar event, much mm-hmm. worse. But at that time, if you think about being a, an individual in 1933, uh, when unemployment, I think, was about 25 percent in the United States, or just absolutely horrific, uh, what would you do if you wanted to understand it? There, there, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, there was nothing to do. And here we live in this time. It doesn't mean you know, everything's great, but at least we live in a time where people can explore things in unimagined ways com- compared to the past. Yeah, definitely. And – Academics can use this stuff to to educate their students, and yeah. I think this is this is a real shame of sort of the structure of 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 academia is that so much um, so much weight is put on research and producing some good research um, that the teaching, like you were saying, no one they, they, you don't get proper training to be a teacher, and that sort of how you engage students. There's, I mean, I had a few professors who were incredible and obviously really passionate about it and put so much thought into it, but they are few and far between. And if you have got all these pressures on you as an academic to produce research, you've got all of this this bureaucracy that you have to do with your students, then actually creating a course that's engaging and using things like the internet, which seems really obvious, is, is you just don't have the time to do that. And so you do end up just teaching the same slides that you've been teaching for the last 10 years that are just not engaging or interesting at all. Um, and that's a real shame. The other point is that when I brought this up again, I bring it up as often as I can, as I, can, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. In a recent episode with Anad Admati, we were talking about the crisis. And unfortunately, many economists benefit either explicitly or implicitly from the status quo. Uh, they They either hope to work for the Federal Reserve. They maybe consult on Wall Street. And so they're they're somewhat compromised. And we think of ourselves economists as these detached objective observers of the human scene. But of course we have our own self-interest. And mm-hmm. I, I referenced then and we'll mention it again now, a conversation with Luigi Zingales, who makes this point, I think very eloquently, many, many times, and it can't be emphasized enough. Economists act like they're just these doctors who come in to repair and and heal the economy, and of course, we're not. We're we're not like doc. We're something like doctors, but we're more like <laughs> doctors who, you know, have imperfect knowledge of how the body works, and who benefit, as sometimes doctors do too, from certain types of treatment as opposed to others. And so, I think it's just really valuable to be aware of that when you're listening to people give policy advice and other things. Yeah, and it's it's also a matter of of, of the lack of diversity within the discipline. I mean, the vast majority of economists are middle-class white men and their lived experiences are significantly different to the lived experiences of massive swathes of society. And so we can't hope for those people in those sections of society to be 
representative in 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 policy decisions. So the the there's a whole point of democratizing economics, that whole branch of what we do, one of the main driving forces behind that is because we want to make economics relevant to people's lives and show them how exciting it is and encourage them to come on and study economics so that we can get a more diverse set of voices um, around the policy table, which I think is, yeah, I mean, that's a huge task, but yeah, speaks to what you were saying a bit. Now, why do you say um, economics is detached from people. And it's a, a theme on your website, various versions of that. What, what does that mean to you? What do you mean by that phrase? So we talk about individual agents maximizing utility um, in a market. And there's no there's no people in that. So we, we look at the rational agent and I'm certainly not rational. So am I, th- does that agent represent me? There's no talk of, of humans really. It's, yeah, it, it seems that we, we're looking at the maths and the theory and we're forgetting that actually these are people doing what people do in a massively complex dance. And by not talking about the people within it, um, we make it less less relatable and less human and less embedded in the world. But I think it's more than that. It, it It's not just that it's not so relatable. And, and we have to concede, you know, there has been a growth in behavioral economics, which does try to introduce some more complexity into individual choice, at least. Uh, I don't know how much of it's made it into mainstream curriculum. Do you have a feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it's getting there. There has been some progress with behavioral economics, for sure. Yeah, I just don't know. I don't think it's it's not embedded in the in the main in teaching and sort of an aside yeah. like oh by yeah, the way yeah. this is a complete it's not in the core curricula you know. yeah it's not obvious you can do that but um i guess the issue for me to take your critique about age rational agents i think there's two things that I, that bother me about that uh it's not so much the behavioral part it's not so much that i occasionally make mistakes which of course i do and we all do we're all we're all human i think it's the it's the when you teach that model over and over again that it's basically – I'm going to give your critique its full due. It's basically saying that you know people are like programmable robots. We just have to get the incentives right. And I'm sympathetic to that point, of course. Incentives matter a lot, as I said earlier. Mm-hmm. But I think once you start thinking of people like robots, you tend to start thinking of – or as programmable or as influenceable, which of course they are. You start to then start to think that, oh, yeah, and therefore I can make society better off by doing X – because I can see – I know how people respond, and then I'll get this aggregated impact, and I can just add up all that utility or happiness or whatever we call it. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the human enterprise. It's it's particularly materialistic. It particularly emphasizes stuff over mm-hmm. over how we experience life. And, you know, one of the things that in the last two or three years I've started to think about a lot is the communal part of our lives – what I call our longing to belong, our desire to connect with other human beings. It's it's totally absent from economic modeling other than in the corners of you know Gary Becker's work or others who are doing what mm-hmm. might be called economic sociology. And that seems to be missing out on like an enormous part of, of, of human well-being. And by focusing on the measurable stuff, which is – I understand the desire, uh, we're missing – an enormous part of the human experience. Yeah, um, and I would, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I would go further than that. Like, I think what is happening to our environment is is a consequence of that because it's not quantifiable. You can't put you can't put a number on 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 the environment, and that means that we've not been able to accurately analyze the issues or accurately understand or provide solutions to the issues that um, we are creating um, because it's just it's it's yeah it's 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 outside of the the remit of the tools that we're using and um, to do that effectively and of course you can doctor the tools that you're using and try and fit bits in here and there but yeah. our critique would be that, that fundamentally that way of looking at the world is not the best way to look at our environmental problems there are other tools we should be and can be using so I'm going to stretch myself here and and try to critique my usual view of things and and get your reaction. So in the United States, we have this phenomenon. I'm sure you have it there as well in, in the UK, but I think it's it's more pervasive here, which is what are called big box stores. 
So we have these enormous retailers like uh, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, and I love them. I love them all. <laughs> I, I confess, I really do love them uh, in some dimension anyway. I enjoy shopping there. They're phenomenal places just to be walking around in. They're brightly lit and their stuff is cheap and there's a ton of stuff. Yeah, I'll never forget. I think I probably told the story before, but I showed up late for my plane was delayed and I ended up, I had to give a speech somewhere and instead of getting picked up at at 7 p.m., I got picked up at midnight and my bag was lost. So I had no clothes. And um, the person who picked me up said, do you want to go, um, do you want to get something to eat? And I said, no, I need to go to, I need to get something to wear. And so we went to a super Walmart. I'd never been in one. It's about 10 years ago. I still don't, haven't been in one since because they don't have them. They don't, we don't let them happen around here in, in outside Washington, D.C. much. But it was an extraordinary experience. It was one o'clock in the morning. It looked like daytime because it was lit like it, was like, mm. it looked like I was near the surface of the sun. <laughs> uh, and they had everything I needed and it was cheap. You know, I bought a shaver and I bought underwear and I bought a shirt and, and I was fine. And it was just it was a glorious capitalist experience. But so that's the romance about in the in favor. Let's do the romance against on the other side. The romance against on the other side is that, you know, small towns uh, that used to have lots of different small retailers now have one giant retailer. It's far away. It's out in the suburbs or outside of town where it's cheaper to build a large building. And the daily lo- the texture of daily life is different. Now, I don't romanticize da- small town daily life because the stores were not so clean and they didn't have much selection. It was really expensive and there wasn't much competition. And so a lot of negatives too. But something has been lost by the move toward the – larger suburban or exurban retailers. And as an economist, my first impulse is to say, well, people want to shop at those big stores. We should let them. And that's – and there's issues of subsidies. Put those to the side for the moment. But we generally believe in America, and certainly my economics training tells me, that if people choose it, it's, it's for the good. But something is lost. And the thing – the point I want to make that I think I, sh- I, I have to concede and people like me politically, ideologically have to concede is that it's not free. Those cheap, that cheap stuff, it's mm-hmm. it, it changed the daily t- the texture of daily life, and that we don't measure. And so I'm not saying it was a mistake that, that people make those choices. I'm just saying that the full picture isn't isn't obvious, and I think uh, that's not so good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the the price mechanism doesn't really work for things like that because you can't put a price on it, and. Yeah, I yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that that capitalism has brought such wonderful things and increased our living standards to such a great extent. But yeah, this 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 stuff isn't free, and we are creating damage. There's we are damaging people by by us being able to consume things so cheaply and so easily. We are creating pain in 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 other areas of life, and yeah, so rethinking economics. That's, I guess, that's fundamentally what it's about: is 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 looking at what what the damage that currently isn't being measured is, and how do we begin to incorporate that in our understanding of economics, and how do we try and mitigate against some of the worst worst excesses of that? And it's not throwing capitalism out. It's not saying that this is this is a terrible model and it's destroying the world. It's saying that yes, some of this stuff is amazing and it's it's improved our lives massively but actually there are some huge gaping flaws here that we need to to come and look at again so i want to try to push this the walmart example a little bit and again i, I want to I'm, I'm ignoring the fact that you know walmart gets subsidized sometimes by tax breaks of course other things get subsidized too it's really a messy complicated thing to fully try to measure those kind of artificial encouragements and discouragements but i'm just i just want to think about the following so you know, I really love – here's two things I love. I love Amazon and I love a good bookstore. And I recognize that Amazon is destroying – has destroyed lots of bookstores. And even though I love the fact that I have a zillion books in my house because of Amazon and a bunch more on my Kindle and that I bought those books because they were so inexpensive and easy to get into my house because of the web. I also like occasionally to wander into a physical bookstore and pick up the books and touch them and look at them. And and, and we all have a temptation to go into those physical bookstores, uh, fondle the books, put them back down, 
and go home and order from Amazon. And we would all say, most people would say, well, that's fair because that's what markets are about. You make your choices. But I think we could have a culture. We could have a norm, a social norm that says, you know, it's not enough to say, well, you know, I hope everybody else buys their books at the little bookstore on the corner because that way I can wander in there every once in a while. But I'll be buying most of my books at Amazon. But it seems to me we could have a norm that says, again, I don't want to penalize Amazon artificially. I don't want to give them an advantage artificially either. But I do think we could have a social norm that says, if you value that bookstore in the corner, you might want to sacrifice some of your standard of living to shop there because if if you only follow the narrowest of self-interest, it won't be there anymore. Yeah, and I think that people – People do. People, yeah, we still have vinyl shops in Manchester. Like, we still have vinyl shops. You better across explain the world. what those are, Mab, because most vinyl. people in America don't know what. They, first of all, that's a UK word, sort of. It's, okay. But it's also out of date. So explain what that is. So, records. So yes. Music, music records, those yeah. big black discs. We yep. still have, yeah, we call them vinyls here. We still have vinyl stores um, in the UK because people have chosen that, that, yeah, that there's other things that they value about listening to music that go beyond just downloading it on Spotify. It's, 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 yeah, going into the shop, flipping through all the little records, taking out this huge disc with this beautiful cover, and they're, they're, they're the things that they value. And I think that there is sort of a huge countercultures in all different aspects. And in, 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 so the, the, the suburb that I live in is, 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 uh, there's this vegan cooperative, uh, grocery store, this big, big store that, that, is thriving like it does incredibly well um and yeah yeah that, that that that's because people there's a morrison's which is a big supermarket chain in the uk there's a morrison's next door so many people go and shop in this vegan vegan cooperative even though it's more expensive because they value the they value the they have they share the same values that this this store does so i think that yeah people do do that if we could uh, yeah i think that they're encouraging those sorts of things um is an important part of getting this right, but obviously these are there's a, they're huge systemic barriers to this. So it's not just about individual choice, like you're saying about Amazon. It's it's the ease of it all. There's, there's a lot of things in place that make it far more difficult to to do the shopping in the little bookstore. And um, that we could we could make some of these things easier for people, I guess. Yeah, it's a challenge because. If you're not careful, you end up supporting legislation that penalizes Amazon, and it's really done for the to destroy the ability to compete with those smaller players. And I don't think we ought to do that. I think that's a mistake. I think we shouldn't be artificially helping or hindering anyone. I'm a big fan of creative destruction, despite what I just said, which is the challenge, I think, of squaring my circle, which is, you know, I love – the idea that the world's dynamic and I don't want to slow it down too much, but I don't mind that if we slow it down through our own choices, you know, we're, we're recording this in um, the middle of November and every year, one of the things I just absolutely um, have intellectual problems with is the Christmas holiday shopping uh, <laughs> argument that it's, we need it for the economy and of course, if if people decided they wanted to spend more time sitting in front of the fireplace and less time working and more time with their families and the economy got a little bit smaller, that would be wonderful if that's what people wanted. If they want to work really hard and have lots of crap. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're no, entitled. I, we're entitled. I do that. Plenty of that, too. I'm not, you know, I'm not being. Uh, but but this idea that somehow we need it for the economy is it's just absurd. It's a horrible yeah, it's way to really think about dangerous. it. And I, 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 I Obviously, I've, I'm sure that you, yeah, we, we disagree on the whole, I don't, I don't think I would use the term, well, no, yeah, pe penalizing Amazon, penalizing these huge uh, monopolies that have an insane amount of market power. And and I, I do believe in, in regulation and government intervention to stop that from happening, particularly with regard to tax and getting them, taxing them fairly. But I think... Um, yeah, this is this this is an obsession that we have with growth, and a lot of this is born of undergraduate economics education. That it, that, we, that a good economy is an economy that grows is is a complete fallacy. Yeah, we could actually stand to uh, 
lose a little growth. We could stand to not, like, the amount of tat you see at, at Christmas, it, the amount of gifts that I get, I'm just like, why would you ever buy this for me? I don't, I don't want this. I don't need this. But it's, it's, yeah, it's good for the economy. So people have got jobs creating this tat, but people have got really badly paid jobs creating stuff that people don't want just so that people can buy more stuff, just so that the economy can grow. And it is completely backwards. And really destructive on, on people's livelihoods and um, just on the state of my living room and yeah on the environment <laughs> did you say tat tat yeah. how do you spell that t-a-t and, and what, how would you translate that for those of us who don't speak english <laughs> who only speak american junk is it junk yeah yeah just like rubbish just like Here, little yeah. bits that you just okay. don't need <laughs> yeah. okay uh glad to get that straight so <laughs> let's close Love that word. Uh, let's close. It's like twee, another one of my favorite uh, <laughs> British words, um, which means I think adorably, unbearably cute. Uh, at least that's the yeah, way I translate it. Yeah, and like a bit traditional. In, like a yeah, tchotchke. Like, That'd be the Yiddish uh, <laughs> version of twee. Well, it's a combination. Yeah. A tchotchke is like a is tat that's twee. Um, <laughs> that's our linguistic uh, lesson for the day. Uh, but let's close with uh, with the fact that uh, I think we don't agree and try to get some understanding of why. So I, we're having a great conversation. I'm enjoying it. Uh, it reminds me of some things I, that I feel very strongly that I sometimes forget about. It ch- stretches me a little bit uh, to think about where I might have my own burdens of my education that, that I don't think about that, that I carry around unconsciously. But we don't agree. I think you're on the more interventionist side of things than I am, I would yeah. guess. Yeah. So the question is, I wonder why that is, given that we both we both don't like many of the things about economics. I wonder what is the underlying cause of our um, our disagreement. I, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer, but I, I, want, to, I want you I've to got, see I've, what you I've can got, say. I've got a guess. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think this is something that, that, yeah, I when you were coming of age and when you were becoming an economist – Economics was like on the up and in its heyday and stuff was going well and this 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 science come religion of economics was really in its ascendancy. Um I had a completely different experience. And this this is what we say I'm slightly older than most of our students, so it, it works um it works I'll do the one that we say for our students and then I'll talk about myself. But our students were coming of age when when economics was just collapsing down around our ears. So they don't have the same like deference towards, not that I'm saying that you have a deference towards it. Obviously you're very critical, but a lot of our professors, a lot of the people that we argue with, um, and deference is probably far too strong a word, but they have this respect for economics that, that students, um, that are the, of the generation just below mine, I would say, um, just, just don't have. So they just aren't, they aren't as convinced. They start off a hell of a lot more critical than um, than a lot of their professors do. With me personally, I'm from um, uh, the northeast of England, which was a huge mining community. Um, and all of them, the, in 1984 to 85, there was a massive miners' strike and the miners lost and all the mines were shut down. And basically the northeast of England is one of the most deprived areas um, in in England slash Europe now um, because they did nothing. So this was an economic decision that was made in Westminster and then they did nothing to try and rebuild those economies. So the the deprivation and the consequences of the the miners' strike that I grew up around made it very... I I started off very critical of economics because I was like, well, that was an economic decision and it was done in the economic good and it's destroyed destroyed my neighbourhood. So yeah, students definitely students today are much more critical of economics just because they never saw it when it was in its heyday. I think that's a potentially correct. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't like the idea that my views, of course, are, are, are came out of my personal experience that I hold my views because they're true, but of course we know <laughs> better. We, yeah. And you too, but we know, we know better. I guess the other, I say the other difference between us, uh, and I think this is generally true, uh, in, in, in ideological conversations, obviously there are underlying beliefs that are below the surface often that are pushing us in certain directions. But I think if I had to justify my tolerance of things that you wouldn't tolerate, I would say that I'm very worried about the concentration of political power 
And at least that's the way I would explain it after the fact. I don't know if that's the real reason I believe it, but I would justify my views by saying, for example, that I don't want Amazon to get a, an extra benefit or a, a penalty from, from government policy um, because I don't want firms to be focused on influencing that. And I worry that government will only help its friends and not do what you and I want, would like it to do. And that's why I would justify it, at least after the fact. I don't know if that's the real reason I'm, I hold the views I do. It could just because of my personal experience and, and to be even harsher on me, it could be because I do pretty well in the current system. Uh, and and it's possible that that I I recognize that could strongly color the way I, you know, I look at it. Um, so – but I do think a lot of people who, who are pro-interventionist underestimate the dangers of concentration of power in, in Westminster. Constant, but definitely there's or, huge or concentrations of power. But, or what, what, yeah, of course, but there's huge con- concentrations of power in business as well that holds incredible sway over our political systems. And that's, that's in no way democratic, at least as a semblance of democracy within our political systems. So I would far rather be beholden to democratic governments than I would be to these massive monster monopolies that are currently dictating my life. Um, yeah, so I think that it's, it, I do agree with you. There's massive concentrations of power that are undeserved and dangerous, but it's... I, it, the, 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 they're, they're both there. They're in business and they're in politics. And both of these um, huge institutions have an astronomical amount of, of sway over our day-to-day lives. My guest today has been Maeve Cohen. Maeve, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.